So I was going to begin this episode about talking about how, for some reason, we have guns. Why do we have guns, Chewie? We're on the Death Star, and we're we're stormtroopers. But um, I I just looked at the news, and my PTSD has been triggered. Wait, these are AK forty sevens. No, sorry. I think we uh, I think we infiltrated the Death Star. Huh. Chewie, our Ferret is getting a season three. Um, hmm. Why do I punish myself? This is the latest episode of the ARPG podcast where we talk about the latest happening in the otaku world, plus also review the latest shows of the past. Well, this time it's three weeks because for some reason, Dewey's fucking computer exploded again. Not exploded. Just At this point, around. it's going to explode. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you're the one that's aiming the gun at it, so... Yeah, pretty much. Anywho, so we're going to catch up with a little bit. First and foremost, we need to catch up with the fact that Genshin Impact is getting an anime. Another video game. Well, it's just it's not just another video game. It's probably one of the biggest fucking gacha games on the planet. Oh, okay. But it's a video game. Yeah, but it's just like... I think our shade and our friends showed me a picture of just how much money Genshin and Fate Go make. Yeah, they make a lot. It's not even fucking close, man. Like, they are just so far ahead of everyone. Oh, I mean, it's a gacha game, but... Yeah, it's a gacha game. <laughs> well, it's a gacha game, but it's like, it's not bad. And like, I played it for a bit and it wasn't bad. But no, we actually had the report a couple days ago. Genshin Impact anime is in the works and it's being made by you foldable. Oh. Uh. Oh, nice. Nice. You foldable. Well, I didn't say yeah, that you... Genshin Impact was bad. I'm just saying it's a video game. It's just. It's another video game anime. But yeah, no. So Genshin Impact anime made by you foldable. That's going to be. I honestly think that should be good. It'll be interesting to see how they handle it. We also got news that Chainsaw Man, for its 12 episodes, is going to have 12 ending theme songs. Ah, that was, that was cool. That's yeah. cool. So, and they announced all of them. So, we have... Uh, let's see. I want to read them. Deep Down by Imer, In the Back Room by Suyodo, Queen Bee is performing violence, and then there's just a lot of them, and there's a lot of big names, too. Like, uh, one of the big names they got that actually kind of surprised me was, uh, Kanaria. Uh, okay. You know who Kanaria is, right? Mmm, that sounds familiar, but I don't know. King and Queen. Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she's going to be performing one of the songs, too. And it's just, it's pretty cool. And it really does feel like they're trying to make Chainsaw Man really, really hit. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the most hyped animes of a fall season that is looking fucking ridiculous. Hello? Yeah, yeah, no, you yeah. know, we heard you completely. Huh? No, like you can hear me, but I'm I, I mute myself on the thing, so I won't show up. Mm hmm. So, yeah, I'm coughing a bit. Chainsaw Man, of course, probably one of, if not the most hype anime of the fall season. Mm hmm. Like, I generally do not believe there's probably one that's more hype. It definitely is really hyped, yeah. It's like either number one or number two. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's... Like, if you look at popularity, maybe Spy X Family and Mob Psycho. Mm -hmm. But, like, other than that, nothing comes close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck is this? Excuse oh, me. Sorry, it was a weird picture. Anyway, but uh, the one thing, the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the whole anime talk is the... 
Well, the um thing that came out about the Crunchyroll dub of Mob Psycho. Crunchyroll dub? Okay. Uh-huh. So it was came out by the voice actor Kyle McCarley that he is most likely not going to reprise his role as a uh, mob, right? Oh, okay. Now, this is coming after he said himself that he tried to set up a meeting with Crunchyroll and the Screen Actors Guild, right? Mm-hmm. To negotiate a contract on, like, future productions. Okay. Like, he said himself he would work it, right? Yeah. Um, he would agree to work on this season non-union. Right, mm-hmm. but he would only do that if they would meet with uh, the Screen Actors Guild and work out something so they can like work out a better deal. Okay. Right. So the main reason is they are not going to produce a show on a. Screen Actors Guild contract, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And McCarley is one of the people who has made it clear he does not work, he does not usually work on non-union based dubs. And so right now, Mom Cycle mm. 3 is set to be non-union based. Mm. Okay. So he was trying to set up a meeting where he would agree to work non-union, hmm. but he wanted to work out something so Crunchyroll would allow them to work union-based pay, right? Okay. And Crunchyroll has just apparently just not said anything. They released a statement later saying that Crunchyroll is excited to bring fans worldwide the dub of the third season of Mob Psycho as a simul dub, right? So same day as a Japanese broadcast. Yeah, okay. So they also say that they're producing the English dub at their Dallas studio, and to accomplish this, they need to recast some role, right? Okay. And it's pretty shitty. Like... Mm. It, it's actually really shitty when you think about it because I don't understand. And we're going to talk in our Zatsu because Twitch has exploded. Yeah. But it's in large part due to the same thing is that they're just not willing to pay. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this with how badly Crunchyroll pays their translators too, right? Yeah. Like they absolutely do not pay them i'm really paying you yeah Uh, so it's just a really shitty situation and the most shitty part is kyle generally like he said to himself he was willing to work he said to crunchyroll i'm willing to work non a non-union contract if you could sit down and like let's negotiate let's set it up so we can get a contract with the Screen Actors Guild that they can use in future anime, right? Mm. That's all he asked. And Crunchyroll has pretty much ghosted him. So it's a shitty situation, and it really just shows that, like, Man, you wish that Crunchyroll could at least. It's weird because, like, I will stand there and say to myself that, like, the thing I hate the most is when I have to go to 50 fucking places just to see anime, right? Yeah. Like, we're still waiting on the confirmation of where Bleach is going to be simulcast. Hmm. It's not 100% confirmed to be Disney Plus yet. 
All we know is that uh, Viz Media have confirmed Bleach will be simulcast. But we don't know what that means because we all saw what happened with Disney, right? Huh. But yeah, no, so it's going to be interesting. And really that whole situation with... Uh, Pile and the whole mob cycle thing is just it's just shitty. Just shitty. Well. Because you can't because you can't think that like the contracts pro union would be that much different, right? Oh it it is. Oh, I could believe it. I'm sorry. I believe it. <laughs> uh, again, it's just shitty. And that's, it really that's shows... why unions exist. I can believe it. <laughs> And it really and it really shows to me then that Crunchyroll still need to work out a whole lot of shit because they still underpay their translators. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Anyway, let's talk about the anime over the past couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Last for the Elite is a piece of shit. I generally despise this show at this point. Hmm. Because again, I've said before, said again. The pacing has been destroyed. Utterly destroyed. It makes any arc that happens not feel it. And when they're finally like, okay, let's actually take our time with an arc, it's the last one, and it is essentially just torture porn. Ugh. Like, Kai has just been tortured to absolute belief and it's just like, okay, this is so much fun. And while watching the dick get, you know, punched in the face, mm-hmm. by this point, I'm just like, I'm just so done with this show. They have completely <laughs> destroyed it because they want to get to... They want to get to the uh, second year arc for season three. Yeah, it does feel like that for sure. Mm, but uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore, so we'll move on to something that's actually really fucking good. I... Okay. 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 So the last time we talked about it, it was on episode 9. Mm-hmm. So episode 10, 11, 12 have aired, and they were honestly brilliant. Brilliant. So we'll start with episode 10. Episode 10... Kind of showed that what I meant. Ainz didn't, was completely taken off guard by the guild member in the red armor suit destroying the Death Knights, right? Vermilion drop. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was completely taken off guard and he has to like fake it, right? Mm-hmm. Now, during that, we also met the guy who was in the armor suit. Mm-hmm. And we also saw how some of the guild members and or importantly, the slain theocracy are trying to handle the fact that, hey, um, the Sorcerer Kingdom is killing everybody, right? Kicking your ass. And it was interesting to see some of the reactions. We saw the leader of the Blue Roses really showcase that, like, she was willing to stay and fight. Yeah. But everyone and we else saw is that like, yeah. We saw the slain theocracy make their move. We yes. met some of their main heroes. Uh, yes. And they're interesting. Is... Why, why did, like, the leader of the group look like that villain from season one? The one that Ainz killed with a hug. The, the guy, right, that looks like the girl? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they're related. Maybe it's just a design thing. But anyway, we, we, we saw that the Vermilion Drop dude was willing to stay and fight, <laughs> while Blue Roses, for the most part, were wanting to get the fuck out, right? But the leader of the Blue Rose was the noble or something, right? So she wanted yeah. to stay. And she's also related to the guy who's, in, who's the leader of the Vermilion Drop, right? It's like her uncle? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the majority of episode 10 was dedicated to the prince. Okay. And it was fucking brilliant. Like, Zank, right? His name was Zank. Mm-hmm. And I loved it because throughout this entire thing, Zank was 
one of the best written characters of the show. Yeah. Definitely. A man who is just trying to protect his kingdom, but also understanding minds his issues, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, like, he... like their talk was very interesting hmm. because I liked how he understood Ainz's main goal of trying to find happiness, right? Yeah, and he wasn't like he was accepting of his fate, kind of like his father, right? So the king is accepting of his fate, he's like telling everybody, Get the fuck out. Mm. Zank is accepting of his fate more in a way that he understands why Ainz is doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it was just a really good episode that was made legendary by the final scene. Yeah. That was kind of... Was yeah. masterpiece and a half. So essentially what happens is the nobles turn on Zank and they kill him. Because they think that's good enough to appease. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? From their standpoint, you know what? Maybe be reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was Maybe. not good enough. It ended up pissing off Ainz to the point where I think that was the first time we've seen genuine anger from him. Mm -hmm. Like, he was piss so he yeah. sends them to that he tells them to bury zank and the king and his guard with respect hmm. and then he just lo loses karen right he just yeah. loses karen he sends them to be tortured by that bug thing yeah and when aura is like when he tells Aura to tell them, when he grabs Aura and you see his face, it's just like, again, this was like one of the first times we've seen genuine anger from him. The moment of, uh, yeah, change, I suppose. Like, even, with Sh even when Shaltier was, you know, mind fucked right mm. it wasn't genuine anger it was more of like a confusion and a wonder there's a lot of cars on this fucking road what the fuck but then with I but then when this happened he essentially killed somebody they essentially killed somebody he respected yeah 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 it just pissed him off yeah no I understand and then he told uh, or did uh to tell oh, Let, and then he left to just like too. give them the most slow painful death even if they ask for uh, mm -hmm. asked to and die and then he left it to uh Kokiotest and left Kokiotest and then the next episode introduced more of the guild that the Vermilion draw uh yeah yeah and the cool thing and I think the most interesting thing was that it Introduce the fact that the Platinum Dragon Lord knows of players and NPCs. Mm -mm -mm. So that asks two questions. A, what is he going to do about it? Since he generally fears players. And B, how many people actually know? Um, like just the fact that we have a character saying he knows it opens the door to so much cool shit. Um, so I find it kind of funny that he thinks Albedo is the player and Ainz is the NPC. I mean, that's because... What? It was Pandora's actor that was Ainz at that moment? and then No, no, it's just because Albedo was using a world... one of those world weapons. Well, I was going to say that too. That but, was the reason. Yeah. But no, so... That was really good, right? I and I like no, it. I literally was going to say that. <laughs> it was literally because of the world weapons. <laughs> and then episode 12. Oh, uh, we get... uh, wasn't. Okay, so this is a little bit of a 
this is a little bit of, how should I say, a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a digging kind of thing. Uh, but the Platinum Dragon Lord wasn't he like one of the thirteen heroes or something? I think it was confirmed. Um, not that. Let me let me just pull it up. Platinum Dragon Lord. I believe he was a Platinum Dragon Lord. Is the Dragon Lord of the Son of the Dragon Emperor, one of the members of the Thirteen Heroes, and a counselor of the Argoline Council. He so, regards what, players as the greatest threat to the New World. Is it? Sorry, the Dragon Emperor was the one of the Thirteen Heroes, or he was one of the Thirteen Heroes? No, he was. He was. Okay. So then I'm wondering here. Thirteen heroes were years after the. What was it? The uh, thirteen heroes were legendary figures who appeared two hundred years prior to when Ainz first woke up. Yes. Yeah, so beef poor ten years, but there was another one before that. There was something. No. There was another group before. Yeah, the evil deities. Evil deities. That was before them too, right? Before Legendary those... figures who appeared sometime before the demise of the eight Greed Kings. The evil deities spread chaos around and were eventually defeated by the 13 heroes. Yeah. The yeah. eight Greed Kings were figures that appeared in the New World. They appeared 500 years ago and appeared to conquer the world with incredible power before succumbing to infighting. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I see, I see. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go on a limb here and probably say that probably a fair bit of those 13 heroes know but the player thing. Um, or at least probably It's hard more. to tell. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense, right? It would so definitely like, make sense because, it, you know, I, I do have a little bit of background insight with what the here's the thing we already know a couple of the 13 heroes right yeah so uh platinum dragon lord evil eye <coughs> and we've or met land crush or whatever it yeah is. land crusher and then we've met legit legit right yeah the other person that showed up was at the end of the season one that visited the platinum dragon lord or was that the second no it was season? end of season may you know end of season one yeah it was in a no, season? Second season. Yeah, second season. It was during the invasion of the tomb. Yeah, so she def she definitely visited the Platinum Dragon Lord then. Yeah, so it's another yeah, there's another one. And Yeah, but she visited him. We don't know if they know. No, no, I don't know if they know. Yeah, but we've seen them, yeah. yeah. But like we've seen them. And like it'll be interesting to see. But then of course the next episode began the invasion. Where essentially Cocteuta, the two. Cocutus, yes. Cocutus, he fought Brain and he killed him in one hit and then froze his body because Cocutus is an honorable warrior and Aura continued her assault. And outside of that, the only other thing that happened was Blue Rose drugged their leader and teleported away. And then, what was it? Uh, Climb and the princess went to her father. Started walking to her father. Yeah. yeah. And they got way, they got the they got the national treasure. That one sure that the was uh buffed by Ainz. But either way, next episode should be great. It's the finale. I'm honestly like when I look at Aura's like um her her pet or whatever whatever pets or animals or whatever her, her familiars they scare the shit out of me, some of them, honestly. That is, that is, is freaky. It's not like, and they're, and I also realize they're also not like all like super, super, super big or anything like that. So, I, I'm kind of curious in how, uh, how they're perceived and stuff. In that what, world. Aura and Mare? No, Aura's whatever the beast that she, Tames or 
I don't know. Well, they're perceived enough to scare the living shit out of people. Yeah, but I, I'd, like, I, I'm interested in, like, what type of beasts and things are they, and, like, what what, what are they seen as in that, like, in the world? The fuck knows. Because then they're not, like, super big or anything like that either, So, but they're still, you know, you know, still kept around for a reason, so. What you ask the weirdest questions. I, I like I like uh, I like the world building. I like the world building. Yeah. Ah yes, I a like, beast we will never probably see that much of again. I like uh, I like learning about things. Fuck you, man. Fuck you. Anyway, we, we, moving we had, on. We had, Make- we had a full season where we didn't even talk, like <clears throat> Einz didn't even do anything, and we learned about everyone else. So, all right, made in the best. Why can't we just learn about other things? You know, fuck you, fuck you, man. Anyway, made in abyss. Um, everyone dies. Like that's just the feeling of the whole episode. Es- essentially, what happened is like Fopta and Reg get in this big fight, and Fopta ends up overpowering Reg, but the fight gets interrupted because, like I mentioned, Reg had to destroy the force field to let Fopta in. You're right. But that also lets all the other monsters in. Mm. Yeah, and let's just say episode 11 is just a fucking slaughter. Slaughter. Like, the monsters are just destroying and killing everybody. And it ends with Fopta regenerating and seemingly ready to fight the monsters as, like... Mm. She got hit with an attack from Belaf that gave her the memories of her mother and now she's in this whole like existential crisis of like oh wait what am i supposed to do now my mom didn't actually hate you it was this piece of shit right Sorry. are you okay huh? are you okay yeah i just had some phlegm in my throat <clears> Can't <throat> <It> help <laughs> well it's just hey, for me devil is a part-timer it's good, but I can't deny my interest to watch it has, like, dropped considerably. Right. It won because I've read it already. Like, I've read up past this arc, and it's a good arc. Okay. But two, it's just, there's nothing exciting happening right now. Mm. So, like, it's good. Like, I don't think it's anything bad. Right. But it's just, it doesn't have the energy that I uh, believe it could be. Oh, okay. Like, the start of the series had a ton of energy. All right. But this one is just, that that middle arc, I never liked it. You mean the, uh, the... Oh, the shit. one where they go to the beach shack. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the I tan lady. I never liked it, and it's just, it kind of just soured me on the show. Like, it's not bad. It's pretty good. Is that the one hey. where they worked at the Brit, the beachside thing? Yes, the beach shack. As I said, where they served the yeah the noodles and stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, like it's it's not bad. It's just, man, I I my interest in the show just plummeted after that. It was definitely different. It was just too slow for me. Uh, I didn't mind the what you call it after though. I thought the beach one was kind of. Yeah. Wait, Call of the Night is up next, and... Wait, did you talk about the the next part already? Well, I've said I've had little to no interest, but anyway. Oh, well, I thought that was okay. I thought I was learning about, was it Chiho's background a little bit? It was cool. And then they but literally anyway. just considered them to be superhuman beings instead of otherworldly beings, but hey. But anyway, Call of the Night. Are we going to ask the same question again? No, because it actually had a very good story turn. 
but it never did answer your question. Well, honestly, that question's still going to be an- asked, but the story turn is enough to keep me distracted. For how long? Well, it introduced real world ramifications. Like? Well, the episode began with uh, our main character meeting this detective, right? Okay. And the detective asks him about a missing person. Okay. And that missing person is the man that got turned into a vampire an episode ago. Oh. Because again, it brings up this question like, okay, you're turned into a vampire. Your friends and family are going to wonder where the fuck you are, right? Yeah. Okay, that's real world implications. And I like Mm -hmm. that. So this detective girl, all right, I already like you. And then the ending of the episode happened, and I'm like, detective girl, you were the best fucking thing to happen to this show. Mm. Because they, so the main character and his two friends, they end up going to the uh, high school. You know, like they always do. Go to the high school and, uh... Ooh. And you, you know that whole gimmick of uh, going to the high school and sneaking in at night, right? Okay, yeah. So... They sneak in. And they talk about this rumor about, like, some old high school teacher. And it turns out that rumor is not just a rumor. It's fucking true. The high school teacher's right in front of them and is trying to kill them. Oh. Because it turns out that high school teacher has been a vampire for about 10 years. 10 years. But he has refused to drink blood. Oh, okay. And because of that, it turned him into a feral beast. Oh, okay. And that, he, he, um... When he attacked them, it was because, you know, how vampires kind of go. They they don't drink blood. They go crazy. Right? Okay, 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 okay. And what I like about it is, again, it showed... Because throughout the whole... Throughout the whole show, they have showcased vampires in this, oh, they're so cool. They're so... Lick, right? All right, yeah. Like the main character said to himself, he couldn't believe that there was th- that this person in front of him was a vampire, because to him, vampires were just the main characters that he met. So of course, the all the girls who were like just like these cool people who have all their lives in check, right? Yeah. And what I like about it is it kind of. Bitch slaps him to reality. But there's because, like a good to the bad type of thing? Well, it's more just... Okay, as he is interrupted by his father. <laughs> it's more just... It's introducing... The idea that... Well, you could have kept talking. I, I muted myself on my side. Well, it's more introducing the fact that the vampires... Our main character looked at vampires as this cool thing, right? Right. But now he's showcased that they most of the time aren't. Because not every vampire has control. Not every vampire just doesn't decide, you know what, I'm going to be a monster, right? Hmm. Not okay. every vampire is like the vampires he knows. And watching him get called out on that was the most satisfying fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Okay. Because it's just... This character has lived with his head in the clouds the entire fucking series. He's like, oh, I want to be a vampire. I want to be this, right? It's romanticized, basically, for him. Yeah. 
but he hasn't even thought of like, wait a minute, if I'm a vampire, I can't meet my family. I can't, I can't really meet my friends. I'll have to drink blood at a constant level to avoid to become what that guy is. Yeah, the, the repercussions of everything, the reality of it. Mm. He just looks at it like this cool thing. And as the old man said, he was tricked. The old man was turned into a vampire without even knowing it. Ooh. Mm. Scary. That's actually kind of scary. Think about it. Yeah, his exact words is, I was tricked, but I fell in love with a woman like that. How foolish could I be? Oh. So, of course, the, the uh, reporter kills him and allows him to die as a human being. Oh. And, of course, Ko doesn't really <laughs> like that because he's a fucking idiot. Right? Uh, and yeah. Ko, it, it's a reality check for Ko because it's going to show him, like I've been saying, vampires aren't these slick, cool people. Really? Right. Most of them are genuine monsters who have had to live their lives in a way they don't want to, right? Mm. Because again, You're giving up your whole entire life. Okay, yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see how this one character changes the whole show for me. Since, well, yes, I still do wonder what the fuck has happened, right? Yeah. I am... Um, Glad that we are finally seeing some real world implications. Okay. A person gets turned into a vampire. He's now a missing person, right? Right. So it's it's good to see. To see the the actual realities of things coming in. Yeah. So like we have the vampires under So when Nico are they gonna Hope. address the big question? The, I guess is the big question. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, we have like the vampires under um, uh, Nico Harada's click, but those are probably the minority compared to the majority, which are probably just the typical monster vampires we all know and love. Hey. Right? That's going to be very interesting to see. There's a lot of cards coming by. What the hell? I really and know he, didn't pick that up. Uh, Dan Matchy's next. I, I don't know. I really don't have much to say about it. I don't know if I actually watched the latest episode of Dan Matchy. Give me a second. Um, here. there was one episode that aired yesterday that I haven't watched, and there was an episode that aired the day the week before. Let me just take a look here. And it's just it's kind of going as I expected. And I like it. I think it's great. But it's just, it's one of those things where it's kind of hard for me to say much of anything because You've already said it all? Pretty said it all, but also it's just, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, right? The Watch this episode. Um, I honestly don't remember if I watched this one or not. No, I don't think I did, so I can't comment on this. I will definitely catch up. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I feel bad because I, I was caught up before, but I didn't. I guess I didn't watch the last two episodes. Oh well. Um, what's after that? Um, after that is Shadow's House. Yeah, do much. It's good. Again, Shadow's House is 
it's one of those shows where it's like overall super solid, but I don't think it's uh uh yeah, I don't think it's uh better than a s seven star out of ten, seven out of ten. No, it's weird. I think right now it's at an eight and it'll probably stay there. Okay. But I don't think it's done enough to like make me go, yeah, that's a fucking incredible show. Yeah, so Good. it won't it won't peak Solid. after eight. Or yeah. But I don't think it's gonna do anything more. I think it's kind of established itself as to what it wants to be. Okay. Fair, that's fair. Yeah, so it's good. I generally like it, but I don't think it's established itself as like anything more than you know. Good. Mm. Anywho, uh, next up for me after that, I believe was check. Alashi. No, actually, it's uh Kageyasama. Uh, oh, what Shogi edition? Okay. It's good. Awashi. <laughs> what about are we saving licorice recoil for last? I usually hit licorice recoil last because you know. Okay, then I'm gonna talk about Issei Miku de Harem. <clears throat> no kidding, I I didn't want to watch that. Yeah, please don't. Anyway, Al Ashi is good rule thirty four content though. I liked I liked the latest episode. I really did, because the latest episode really showcased a couple things about football that I enjoy. Not a One, so idle. Yeah. Tactic switching. Ah. So the end the so the tying goal the tying goal ends on a tactic switch where the winger the left and right fullbacks pinch up, and because of that, that changes the defense entirely, right? Yeah. It's they need to. So something like that is something I adore because that's something you'd see in like real football and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing I liked is they really showed how morale, like morale, and it can impact a player. Because Kanade, you know, the big doofus idiot on the other team, not yet, was utterly dominating yet. people. Like, he was literally dominating. And then the second he realizes, oh, they aren't getting pushed over, he starts falling apart. Mm -hmm. Like, throughout the entire second half that we saw, he was just getting absolutely blasted by the three-man defense of uh, Espeon. It was uh, Togorashi's, like... Togorashi... What? Okay, first off, it wasn't it, like... They broke him down on so many levels. Like one was like it was tactic wise since they played together in teamwork. Well, the with two that. defenders, um, biker dude in the redhead, Togorashi, and I forget his other name. Ak Ak they something. started to actually get in sync a lot more. Yeah. So tactic wise, well, team wise, they, they started to do better than well, him what, and his team. Well, what really destroyed Kanade is that they weren't afraid of him anymore. Nope. And then it became very, very evident because Toga, uh, was it? Is it Toga, Togashi? Like, absolutely the... overpowered him. He, he, because he originally was a physical player and that was shown Ooh. in the flashback. And he's, and everyone's like, you know, I, I can't stand you, Togashi, but like, you're the only one right now that could deal with him. Yeah. And he tried to make a move and Togashi just laid his shoulder into him and fucking. Oh my god. And then he, that, that was like a complete. You could just see Canada just like, you know, what the f, you know, what the fuck. And his morale just turned the other way around. And then this is absolutely insane. And then this led to Canada stealing the ball off a uh, pass back. So in football, the, in football, the morale thing is if there's an injury and the team kicks the ball out. The the opposing team will give them the ball back after the after the throw. It's an unspoken rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so Kanade, him. literally, as soon as Esprion touched the ball, just jumped all on top of them. Right, 
-hmm. and he tries to do thing and of course he just can't they have absolutely shut him down and then of all people aoi sticks the knife in his back all right he calls him out on it yeah he really calls him out on it, and then freaking the, the ref yeah. gives him the yellow card, right? Or is the yeah, red and card? The ref right? shows him the yellow. Yeah, shows him the yellow card. <laughs> and like by then, it's just like he's shot. And then, of course, the tactic thing that I mentioned happens, where the wing the wing backs pinch up. So instead of like running a five three one, or mm -hmm. the five three two, it's five three it's five three. What? No, wait, what? No, it'd, it be a, like, it'd be 5v3. It'd be 5v5 five, 3 2. So five defenders, three midfielders, two attackers. Yeah. So this... instead of that, they switched it and they pushed up to a 3 5 2, which Wait, allowed the what? wing backs to pinch up. I thought there was only two center backs. Yeah, but the, the kid with the bandages has essentially been playing center back the entire second half. I thought it was I thought it was a defensive midfielder, so you mean he went back basically? He went back even further. Mm, give me one like second he here. hasn't been playing offensively at all in the second half. Give me one second here. But essentially what happened is the formation switch leads to the tying goal, and that's how the Final episode. That's how the second to last episode ended. Oh, so they do like a. That's that is weird. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Well, you can get weird with formations, right? Like Ajax in the Eredivisie, they run what is essentially a three, two, one, are, four. Are you sure that's a three in the back? I feel like that's a two, and then there's just like there's. Four three or four midfielders and one of them just happens to be just back there as well it's more or less a three five three two three five two three five two but like what i was about to say is like ajax in the air divisi they run a formation that is essentially just a three two one four but there are two center midfielders are placed above each other right so essentially they have an attacking midfielder, but he's not technically an attacking midfielder. Uh I can believe that. Played a lot in Nazma Eleven and there was a lot of different formations. Yeah. One of them I think But you was know like, me, you know me. I love football. I love looking at formations, right? I think one well, my, of them was so weird as like four top or five top. It was so no, there were formations like that. I know there is so, essentially so a, there is essentially a 4-2-4 four four formation, which is four attackers, two midfielders, four defenders. I think the one they went with was four or five. What is it, five top or four top? Four top? Probably four. Five top isn't that likely since you usually run two strikers with two wingers. Four top. The Still, formation you're probably thinking of is probably a 4-2-4 or maybe a 4-1-5. It might be a 4-4-2, no, think... actually. Two center back. It's, I think that, yeah, I think it might be 4-4-2. The, the ones that I've that would be playing. really bizarre. I know, it's they, they play so different. It's, it's I, kind of, it would be kind of weird to run two right backs in that situation as right wing backs. But anyway, so the game, the episode ends with the tying goal. And overall, next week, well, not next week, literally tomorrow. Is fall season. Yeah, well, it's the finale. Fall season. And oh my god. What? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll ask you finales next week. No, I just noticed some of the stuff that was added to Winter 23. Mm -hmm. Anyway, no. um... Let's move on to Utaro Mayu. Okay. It ended its latest arc. Essentially, the la these arcs are all about, oh, we just so happen to be going to the home of our friends while recruiting some people. Mm -hmm. And it was good. I liked it. I liked the Sokinir family. It's quite fun. 
And if there's one thing I like, I like how everyone is slowly realizing Ostor is actually Haku. <laughs> it's kind of amusing. <laughs> but yeah, so Ostaro is like, they're preparing for that. While Raiko, and here's the interesting thing. So Raiko's the main antagonist of the first arc, right? Mm. And he, during the episode, he brings up why is he, why he's doing this, right? He believes that the yeah. nation of Yamato is not in a good place because they relied too heavily on the former Mikado to do everything. They were living in bliss okay. because the Mikado was this legendary god who could create anything and everything, right? Oh, the Mikado, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Yeah. And he wants to bring them back so they can actually be li live, since it's implied pretty heavily that if Yamato in is invaded by Kuan's kingdom, right? Toskara? Mm-hmm they'd be absolutely massacred. Even with the power of the eight generals, they'd still get defeated. Yeah. Because as a whole, the eight generals do not do enough to save them. It'd be the eight generals against an entire fucking nation, pretty much. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> Are you what? Uh, I I got stuff to talk in Zatsu. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Anyway, the the idea is that again, Raiko he wants to bring the country Yamato essentially to fend for itself, mm. since the Mikado was doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And it's what makes Raiko such a really good villain. Because you understand his viewpoints. Anyway. I before I talk about licorice and engage kiss, can I just crucify Ruby? I mean, sure, you've already done that before, but sure. Yeah, but it ended and it's terrible. Okay. Like it's just one of the worst fucking shows I've ever watched. Mm. But you know what? Screw it. We'll save it for next week when we do the reviews. Oh, well, yeah. That's right. So, Engage Kiss continued. And like I mentioned, in the last episode, they were at the point where um, Kisara and all that was stabbed by um, Shun's sister. Uh... Who has been turned into a demon. Ah, and they're yes. and the evil villains trying to use it as a way to open the gates for other demons to come. The interesting thing about that is in the latest episode, they revealed more about the sister. And right. I like it because it turns out the sister who's been in stasis, right? Mm hmm. She is essentially a three year old with a nuclear bomb. Hey, my f oh, right. So she has the emotions of a three-year-old because she's never grown up past three since she's been in stasis since three. Yeah. But she's probably the most powerful demon known to man. Mm. And the only reason she's attacking people is because she just so happened to be able to see everything that Shu's done since the beginning. Mm. And it's not been pretty. So essentially she's attacking out of jealousy. Like, don't take my little big brother away from me type thing. Mm. And I like it a lot because it makes sense. Okay, okay. Anywho, Licorice Recoil is just like setting itself up for the obvious death of Chisato, isn't it? Maybe. Like, the entirety of the last episode was Yoshimatsu saying, what? 
Oh, sorry, I thought you interrupted me. Anyway, the last I episode was no essentially because I, yeah, no comment. Was essentially Yoshimatsu telling Chisato, "Kill me, and you get to live." And Chisato would just refuse because, again, Yoshimatsu's whole goal was, "You have a talent for killing. Actually, fucking use it, right?" Mm. But of course, Chisato's hell bent against that. And this, again, the whole episode was just watching Chisato seemingly say, I'm going to die. And it, okay. again, the whole episode makes me wonder, are they actually going to kill her? They're going to pull because, a 360 or 180? Well, no, because... The writer has said he wanted to create an Asuna Yuki situation. Mm. So if you don't remember, Asuna and Yuki situation he's talking about is Mother Cesario SAO. E. Where Asuna bonds with Yuki to the point of like they're becoming like sisters, and then it's revealed that Yuki has AIDS. Yuki has AIDS? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Yuki had AIDS, and she eventually dies because, you know, kind of hard to beat AIDS, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he said he's trying to set up a situation like that. And while I'm like, okay, for the most part, he's got it. He's missing one crucial thing. Okay, I'm sorry. The way that you deliver that... Oh, I just bumped my monitor. Uh-oh, I can't see anything. Uh, But... The way that you just said that, I'm sorry, that was, that was brutal. <laughs> anyway. What the fuck? So like I said, I not he's trying that. to set up the Asuna Yuki situation. Yeah. And I, I think he's missing one crucial thing. Sorry, you're talking about the writer, right? In, this, in the yeah. customer crawl? Yeah, okay. So I think he's missing one crucial thing. In Mother's Rosario... Mm -hmm. Yuki's fate was never in doubt. She was always going to die. Because she's fighting a, a disease, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very in Licorice terrible. Recoil, Chizato's fate is in doubt. Because she could live. And that removes the impact from it. Because you're getting to the point where you're killing a beloved character. Mm. And that to me, I just, I think the show would do a lot better if Chisato lives. Mm -hmm. Because I do not think for the story he wants to tell, or she, I don't know if it's a girl. Anyway, I don't know if the story the author wants to tell works, because they are missing that point of Chisato's fate. Because Chisato's fate is not 100%. So I don't think trying to go for a Mother Rosario story works that way. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Anyway, you want to talk about Parallel World, or shall we end it here and then go to the Zatsu? Uh, we can talk about Parallel Isekai, whatever, Parallel World All Pharmacy. All right, talk about Parallel World. So, I think... Um, yeah, I don't know. I think the writers or whomever the directors understand that the this arc that they're working on right now was like was very slow in the manga. I felt honestly, it honestly felt like it dragged really, really badly, and it looks like they've paced it enough to deal with it fast enough that we don't have to feel like it's um dragging at all in the anime which is good so far which is great um so next arc is actually dealing with the bubonic plague yes ah interesting <laughs> there is a bubonic plague in this uh other world where magic exists and stuff <laughs> and uh uh, I believe it was so earlier when um when MC oh what's his name now what's he called now he's called like 
Falma? Yes, Falma de Medici. Yeah. Uh, Falma treats the Empress, right? And cures her of the White Death. Mm-hmm. Or I think it's like bronchitis or something. I could be wrong. Um, his dad was also uh, head of the Medici family, was also rewarded as well with some land and money on top of that. That land was, I think, Marseille, and they visited it like a couple episodes ago where uh, his sister goes out to the beach and like gets caught in the current and then, you know, he, he opens up the sea basically to save her. Uh, that's Marseille and everything. So in Marseille, um, there was a, I believe there was a rogue ship that got docked there and stuff. And there was like a whole bunch of like, uh, uh, what was it a whole bunch of like wagons that were like leaving and stuff like that, but like somebody got uh sick or something, and they're now utilizing the um the microscopes now they basically uh, like the microscopes were were mass produced by the f- was it the the f- medical guild or something like that the school of medicine or something royal school of medicine or something like that, and so people. Uh, we're utilizing the microscopes and the little sample uh, uh, bits and everything like that. So uh, I believe one of the people at Marseille, since they're like, they're now subjects to the Medici family, um, uh, they respond to them, of course, right? So there was somebody that got sick from this like random ship that docked there and they were... Uh, they took a sample and they're like, "Oh, it's like there's something here. It's like it's, it's a, it's like a microorganism we've never seen before." They so they send it to um, and they make like samples and stuff. And I believe, uh, Thalma gets a like gets a hold of the information stuff like that, and he finds that it like lines up perfectly or something with um, with another case that I believe he. I could be wrong, sorry, about the last episode, my memory's a little hazy on that, but basically he finds out that the bubonic plague has arrived, basically, and then he goes to Marseille, I believe, and he isolates it, like, he, he, I believe he creates, like, a gigantic, like, ice dome <laughs> to, to isolate them, um, with, like, only a couple exits, so to regulate who comes in and out, and, like, he treats a whole bunch of people, and then he, like, basically quarantines them all from each other type of thing. And he finds out that there's actually like, car- like carts that got out from that ship and stuff like that, and or like the source of the in fact the bubonic plague was the ship and everything, and they already had dealt with other people, but there was like people missing and cargo missing and stuff like that. So there's this like race against time, uh, where he needs to like figure out where they're going, and deal with the current situation of like the people getting infected in Marseille to isolate it. So then he mm-hmm. like. He quickly he starts making like the uh, the medicine with his abilities and stuff like that, and while also getting this like getting people to find out like where uh, the 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 cargo the missing cargo or missing people went. Apparently, they like uh, on the outskirts of town they caught some people that got like left behind or something by uh, the missing people in cargo, and he finishes up over Mercer quickly rushes over and finds out that like. Okay, yeah, these people, they were left because they were too sick to move on. And they were interrogated basically right there. They are like, okay, you know, uh, we're being, we're moving like a whole bunch of like cargo to the capital. And it's like, there's apparently like uh, live animals within it. And he's like freaking out. We're not freaking out, but then he's like, oh, like, you know, are they rodents and stuff like that? And he's like, yeah, they were like some sort of like uh, albino squirrels or something, or white squirrels that could like fly, like the sugar gliders okay. almost in a sense, flying squirrels. And they were um, part of a, uh, they're part of a recent incident that happened in like a neighboring uh, empire uh, on like a, a isolated, um, a uh, small island where like a whole a whole settlement just died because of this infection that was brought by the 
those rodents and it's a bubonic plug so it's like okay great so they're weaponizing it <laughs> so they're using their two bioweapons in this case because essentially his um, the empire that he's in is being attacked it seems like it's being attacked by the uh, somebody or you know maybe the neighboring empire who, who knows but somebody's weaponizing that basically and is trying to get the bubonic plague into the empire and um apparently there's people there that are carrying or escorting it and there's also there's also um holy knights apparently going with them too and he's like holy knights <laughs> it's like apparently uh they're um I, don't know, I, th I believe it was explained they were like trained by the church or something but they ha had access to magic and like martial or not martial arts training but like weapon training and stuff like that so they're trained to be warriors and, ma and magical warriors basically so <laughs> he starts having to rush back and uh they've already um he already sent like a head a message uh earlier when he was dealing with the marseille that there was like a chance of like the bubonic plague uh oh, oh there was a there's evidence of the bubonic plague in that area and there's a chance that there was the bubonic uh people were trying to spread the bubonic plague to other parts so they were to isolate especially the capital so his dad actually responded to that and um and told the empress the empress had locked down basically and like was like very was handling security and like and um pharmacies were encouraging like to wear masks and stuff like that which is interesting you know you, you, you don't you don't think about that but they're in like they're, for, they're trying to help all the regulations and stuff like that like you know like we did with covid type of thing um and then the ending of the episode i believe is where that uh the group of uh the missing people and the cargo with the squirrels uh gets in and um they attack one of the gates and the they're trying to like close it off and stuff like that but it gets like blown open by the holy knights or whatever break it down with magic and then one guy just like pushes a cage into past the gate and like just faints i don't know if he dies or he's just like he's super sick but um mm -hmm. the holy knight's just like well not all of you guys uh lived and he just uses opens up the crate and uses a wind magic just he throws all all the squirrels everywhere you just see the squirrels just flying away and they're all everywhere and that ends the episode there <laughs> so now falma i believe is like he's flying on this like um he got a divine artifact or something a couple episodes ago from that like archbishop that only um the incarnation of the god of medicine could utilize and he's basically flying as fast as he can from the coast to the to this capital so he's got to beat the clock now while he while the um his subordinates and his uh colleagues tried to deal with the squirrels that are now there not great not great sounds like fun yeah all righty shall we end this episode here um I'm watching Tokyo Mew Mew and I don't know what's going on. I think that is a perfect way to end the episode. Like, dude, I, I don't so know. Next don't week, know. the episodes of the pod, next week will be another episode of the podcast as it will be the f summer review. And then, of course, we'll preview the fall season because just holy shit, that fall season is stacked. Dude, I want to talk about that a little bit, but then I'm looking, but I'm like, oh no, we got to do the fall preview though. So let's, I, I want to talk about like, I saw something in spring 2023, winter 2023. So I want to talk about the Zatsu. So let's go. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about the, uh, well. Did we end the episode? No, we're still in the Death oh. Star. Yeah, so eating. let's end the episode. No, no I'm just, what? Just end the fucking episode, Chewie. I, I just want to say, I hope you enjoyed the little bits of videos I made before, or like 40 seconds long. Or like to fill in the, the gap that we didn't upload anything. Bye.